So uh, Lynn, let me, I told you I was going to ask this question. Um, I teach apologetics. Uh, it's one of the classes that I teach. And um, recently, five, last five, 10 years especially, apologetics has really uh, come under some level of attack um, within the broader evangelical world um, uh, as being no longer necessary, irrelevant, uh, et cetera. And so just hoping to get your insight on what you see the role of apologetics being in this culture now, um, some, some ways to practice apologetics effectively to talk to this culture. Okay, good question, and uh, good to see you all back, and glad to be here. Um, the most important thing is um, to understand that this now, this culture is a mission field and you were all missionaries. Um, my wife and I have a missionary marriage. We're raising missionary kids. That's how we've been, we've trained uh, to think of, of who we are and what we're doing. This is a mission field out there. So when you talk about apologetics, you gotta talk about what does it mean to do apologetics in a missionary context? I grew up in a world where the church had the home court advantage. Christianity had the home court advantage. They're now all away games. Away games is post-Christian. They're not just away games. The crowds are cheering for the Christians not to win. That's post-Christian. That's anti-Christian. So, and l let me give, just give you, just, just so that you can do this little exercise in case you ever get, you kind of go into another default um, this is the, uh, bring up, if you'd bring up the Yahoo search bar, um, if we just bring up the Yahoo search bar, okay. Let's just do, why are Christians so? And these are the top 10 things that this culture thinks about you and me. So the first thing is we are judgmental. You'd think we'd be able to spell judgmental, right? But, uh, um, hateful, happy, there's one. I, I, I think that's a, a plant, actually, because people don't get despair at how bad these are. Mean, stupid, intolerant, annoying, self-righteous, ignorant, and uh, arrogant. So this is why come to church doesn't work in this culture. Okay, Christians are this. Where do Christians like to hang out? Church. So when you say somebody, your evangelism is, will you come to church with me? So you want me to go and hang out with people who are judgmental, intolerant, ignorant, arrogant. Okay. Um, so we, we need another way of, of thinking about apologetics and the larger issue of evangelism in a, in a uh, missionary context. Um, now, I remember the first thing a missionary does, wherever they're going, is they, they don't do anything until they first do what? Learn the language. And that's what we've been trying to do. This language of this culture is narrow foreign soundtrack, narrative soundtrack. So we've got to come up with apologetics that speaks that language, first of all, which is not a rational apologetics. And this is the problem with a lot of the apologetic literature that you find from Josh McDowell and others um, although McDowell has himself admitted that his previous books on apologetics kind of don't work anymore. Um, so I, let me, we, we spent the whole time on this. Let me just answer it as briefly as I can if you want to push it further. Um, I think the ultimate apologetics for this missionary context, the ultimate apologetics is an aesthetics. It is not a rational point-by-point um, -point rebuttal the ultimate apologetics in a missionary context is an aesthetics. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. You live the beauty of Jesus in your life. That's the ultimate apologetics and aesthetics. And a relational aesthetics is that, at that. Uh, it's not a how do I rationally argue with people who don't believe there is a God or hate us. It says, how do I let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me? So um, in answer to the question that 
he told me was coming. Well, but now I don't know what you're going to say, so it's your turn. Questions? Yeah. Just telling the story to, like, at the table, how would you start with that if you don't really, like, as you're raising a family? All right, that's a really good question. Just the kind of, um, is there an app for that or something, you know? <laughs> Let me also say, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate app. Okay? So all this stuff about, you know, give me an app for this, and at the end of every sermon, where's your app? Forget this. No, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate app. The Holy Spirit will reveal to you how that applies in your life. Right? So Jesus didn't supply apps to his parables and his stories. But we do need some, some help. And, 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 you know, there's no one right way. There's many right ways. Let me just tell you one of the things that we do, uh, we've done with our kids, um, it's, it's story time at the table, and everybody kind of, you know, what's going on? It's time to connect with everybody's story and updates on the story and if there's new chapters. Uh, if things get slow, which they often do, you know, and people are just, everybody's having trouble um, coming down and coming together. Um, here's what my wife and I have done, and... Um, but it's got to be, there's got to be some preface to it. We do not, we have a very small house. Um, and, but it's filled with stories. We don't allow stuff into our house. We only allow stories. So everything there, I don't care whether it's a painting, curtains, Everything has got to have a story. Because if it doesn't have a story, it's stuff. And Christians don't collect stuff. Consumers collect stuff. We surround our life with and build an identity on stories. So everything there has a story. Now, part of passing on the tradition is passing on those stories to your kids. So it's... Uh, it's called stump the parent time. And so I go, okay, things, let, let's just see if you guys can stump us. So they go stomp through the house, find something that they don't know the story of, and they bring it to the table. They can open up drawers, do anything, find anything in the house. And if we cannot tell the story of what's there, it, they can give it to somebody, a friend, but we have to get rid of it. Because if it's lost its story, it's now just stuff. So that makes table time, even when it gets slow, then it kind of gives it a new, new burst of energy because they can, you know, get to stump their parents and tell us that we forgot and we're just collecting stuff now and, you know. So that's one way, just one way of doing it. Make it fun. Um... But everything needs to, you just, you know, marinate your mind and soak your spirit in each other's narratives and each other's stories. And this is, this is all about, you know, whoever you allow to be the author of your story is your authority, author authority. It's the same. And I only want Jesus to be the author of my story. So he is the authority, and part of the table time is making sure that we're all being authored, and our, our authority is from the same place. Oh. Comments? Just one idea. Yeah. There you go. Let me give you the... Wait, we got somebody coming with a mic here. That's great. Everybody can hear you. Um, you mentioned how... A, like we're supposed to be missionaries to our culture. What's the ultimate goal of that? Like, do you want to transform culture? Do you want to bring Christian? Like, do you want to make Christians in the culture? What's kind of the ultimate driving goal behind that? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, and that's kind of the question we were talking about up here too. Um, I am not a a church of Niebuhr wrote this in classic text. I don't know if you're familiar with it, Christ and Culture where he comes up with a five-fold typology for the interaction of Christ and culture. Um, he, he says he's not going to um, 
kind of weight each either one and um but he does kind of he ends with i think the one where he really is which is christ transforms culture um this is i hate to I hate to put this this is so for me not jesus okay uh, let me let me put it another way and i don't even use the language of transformation cuz there is this i i don't think you can get rid of this element of Bad colonialism. There's, there's good colonialism and bad colonialism. I mean, we're trying to colonize earth with heaven. We pray the Lord's Prayer every day. But there's bad colonialism. If I go to China, I'm a missionary to China. Hi, I'm here to transform your culture. You see what I mean? And whenever, so immediately when I think of transformation, I'm thinking of something, it's in my image that I'm familiar with, that I'm going to transform you somehow into my likeness. No, it's the likeness of Christ, all right? And Christ, the gospel spreads not as a potted plant, but as a seed. And it comes up differently in every culture. You with me? I mean, I, I was in Africa, speaking at an African church. And I was so excited. Everybody was in African garb. It was a beautiful day, so we said, well, let's go outside and worship under an African tree. And the first song that we sang under the African tree was Shout to the Lord. I go, I came all the way around, halfway around the planet to sing Darlene Check, a Hillsong, suburban, middle-class, Australian. I'm in Africa. Where are the drums? Where's the beat? Where's the... The jumping, we're, oh no. A Jesus, a gospel that's incarnated in Africa will, there's certain parts of Jesus that I will never know until Jesus is incarnated in Zulu culture and Swahili culture. You with me? So it spreads as a seed and comes up differently. It looks differently. And that's part of what it means for the body of Christ to reach its full stature is that Jesus is all things are becoming united in Christ. That's the secret that has been kept hidden. The secret is everything is coming together in Christ. And, and that robe of many colors, that coat of many colors, Jesus died in a seamless garment. And when that coat of many colors becomes seamless... A seamless garments, and the gospel is incarnated in all the cultures of the world, and the beauty of Jesus that embraces every single culture comes alive. So I want, Jesus said, I want you to put my disciples in the world, don't let them be of the world, but don't take them out of it either. So it's this threefold thing, we're to be in it, not what? Not of it, but not out of it either. And in academic circles, we want to be out of it in an intellectually in way. Kind of that's the the third academic uh, kind of curl in the pig's tail. So now, in the world, so in every culture, I don't care what the culture is, the gospel goes in it, but it is not of it. Jesus is in it, but not of it. But we're not to be out of it either. And a lot of a lot of times we like to hover, like hovercraft over the culture, so we can say we're in it. We're not of it, but no, but we're basically out of it. Now, what does it mean to be in it? Um. Thank you. Okay, so in addition to learning different languages in a culture, should we also learn cultural images as well? Yeah. Uh, like some cultures don't view, say, pigs the same way the Jews did. So, yeah. If we, um, yeah. And, and, and there are various subcultures. We've got to learn different subculture languages. But he, here's, the, here's what's happening in the world today. And um, this is a world where there is a new normal distribution curve. Do you all know what that means, a normal distribution curve? The, the standard deviation, the standard normal distribution, distribution curve is a bell curve. Okay, that's what's called a bell curve. And, it, and if it's ball bearings, it'll always be a bell curve, <laughs> all right? But culturally, it actually happened that in the modern world, 
world created by Protestant Reformation, Gutenberg Press, all that stuff. Industrial, mechanistic, modern world. Culture formed a bell curve. So you had very weak ends and huge middles. Everything massified in the middles. That's why we talk about mass culture, mass media, mass technology. Ma everything was massified into these huge middles. And um, if you want for your greatest influence in a bell curve world, where do you position yourself for the greatest influence? In the middle. So we were trained to think middle, via media. We were trained to think general. I got to reach the greatest number of people, the general. Think of all the companies named general. General Electric, General Mills, General Motors, which almost went under thinking there was still a general motor. General Dynamics, you got this, General Foods. We, we just could go on and on. I, my, I have come from a tribe, they have a general conference. General superintendents. We, we were trained to do general. That world is gone. That world is over. It is, there is a new normal distribution curve. It's no longer a bell curve world. It's a well curve world. And I get that metaphor from Daniel Pink, um, who's a kind of a corporate consultant and uh, is trying to help the business world come to terms with a world where opposite things are happening at the same time and they are not contradictory. Let me repeat. Opposite things are happening at the same time and they are not contradictory. So the world is getting more global and the world is getting more local, more tribal. See, all middles are in trouble. Nation states were middles. Denominations were middles. Created the same decade, 1640s. Westminster Assembly of Divines created denominationalism, 1643, 1648. We, Treaty of Westphalia created nation states. All nation states are in trouble. There's huge pressures towards, you see this, secessionist movements are huge now in the U.S. Um, Pacific Northwest thinks Texas is a different country. How can, with you know... And there's actually talk about combining with, with BC, British Columbia, and, and Vancouver, and all that stuff, and with Oregon, and Washington, and BC, and parts of Idaho, and creating a new, a new kind of entity called Cascadia. I mean, there's this huge numbers of... So, so we're having... The world's getting more global, and the world's getting more tribal. I, all middles are dropping out. So in this kind of a world... The worst place to position yourself is in the middle. You got to build a bridge and get over it. That's how I put it. You gotta. So we got to learn to speak global, and there is a global culture emerging. It's bar partly shaped on pop culture, um, and there is a. Uh, you've got YouTube songs now with one billion hits. This is just on YouTube. One. Billion. In other words, one out of seven people on the planet have gone to YouTube and watched this. Avicii. Wake me up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Hello? Okay. Maybe we ought to have you all listen to it. Um, so you got one, over one billion hits. You got some songs with one billion. So it's getting more global, but we're also getting more tribal at the same time. And so we've got to learn to speak um, both and become multilingual as we constantly learn to speak a global language and address a global culture, but also a particular one. Now, here's the, here's the, here's the a, princ a key principle. To get to the universal, you got to go through the particular. You per you localize in order to globalize. You get you do the particular well, and it will have universal resonance. So you don't start with the uh, global. You start with uh, yeah. Jesus cried over a place. What was the place named? Jerusalem. 
And put it another way, Jesus loves the city enough to cry over it. You love your city enough to cry over it? Let me, put it, let me tighten the focus. Jesus loved a zip code enough to cry over it. Does your church love its zip code enough to cry over it? Does it even know its zip code enough to cry over it? So we're doing franchise church. We're not doing zip code church. So we got to you particularize in order to universalize. Yeah. Um, so relating to the concept of Nerefor that you talked about um, yesterday, first I thought it was brilliant to observe that our culture like communicates primarily through the images wrapped around a story with a soundtrack. Um, even if that image or the story has nothing to do, like for example, with what they're actually selling, like the wolves and the snow in the hotel. It's the the feeling and the story and image. And you gave a really good or you gave an example of what you meant by that, talking about the Emmaus Road story. And it seemed, uh, at least to me, to wrap around the image of like the wounds of Jesus and communicate that truth. Um, but there was something in me that just rubbed up against the fact that the actual wounds of Jesus weren't in the text, and that you talked about words being um, not as important to this culture, um, but I guess my question would be, you didn't seem to discard their value altogether. My question would be, what is the place of the actual words um, in the text, and like, are they, are they just a, our source material for, um, you know, uh, making an image, um, even if that, that, that image we're, we're selling isn't directly related to what is in the actual text, or is it? Uh, is there a happy balance to find between like, can we can we make an image that's wrapped around um, the words that are there, or am I misunderstanding, or like, do you get the gist of my question? What's the role of the word if it's not? Okay, but but he, you're culture? you're assuming here, and this is a is a really good question. Although you notice he warmed the water before he drowned the cat. Did you notice that? <laughs> Uh, you always can sense the cat being drowned when the water gets hotter and hotter. You know? um, there, you're assuming that the Bible was written in words, see? And, and no, the Bible, and that's a versitis. I mean, that's really versitis. The Bible was written as letters, stories, hymns, songs. So you have to read it as it was intentionally written. It wasn't written, okay, I'm going to give you these individual itemized words, and each one of these, you know, words is what you build your faith on. That is so modern. It's so modern a thought. I mean, it's just, you know, it doesn't even occur in history until, you know, a couple hundred years ago. No, the, you, you, the, Jesus is the greatest storyteller who ever lived. He's a master storyteller. And any storyteller would tell you that the key point, that what they want out of the story often is never, it, it's in the silences. Like in music, you, you, you don't have notes without silences. And the silences are what really make the, the, the song sing. And it's the same with stories. It's not that, okay, the word wasn't, the word wounds wasn't there. No, but when he said, then they recognized him. That's the exact translation. Then, they, well, what's the then? So then you, you, oh, wow. But see, we've lost the ability to hear the text as narrative. And that's what I say. That's why in doing this, we're going to rediscover our original language, the first language of the church, the first, the native, our native tongue is precisely here. Um, and to read every story, to read every story this way. You've been trained to think that the inspiration is in the words. I'm telling you, back of every word is a backstory, and back of every backstory is a root metaphor. No, the real inspiration, you can trust the story. You can trust the metaphor. You can trust your life to the story. This is the only story you can trust your life to. This is not a culture that want, that's going to trust words. They don't think in words. They don't, they don't trust words. No. But they're looking for a story, a life story. And you can try, there's only one story you can trust your life to, and that's this story, the Jesus story.
So it's a, it's, a, it's a new way, which is an old way, which is the original, correct way of reading the text, which is not as these isolated, segmented, bird-in-pan words, but as a living, living narrative, a living story. Okay, thank you. Anybody else want to warm any more water? Yeah, okay. <laughs> You said yeah. that you grew up um, in the Amish household. Almost, yeah. Almost. Um, how, how did you like enter back into the you know to the world and like without swinging the pendulum too much to the right or the left, you know, but like being in the world but not of the world? How did how did you maintain that balance? Well, yeah, that's a good. I had my own rumspringer. Um, it wasn't called that, but it, it was that. I I deconverted at seventeen. I. Um, and this is, anybody, do you all look at Victor Turner and his anthropological theory of liminality at all? Anybody here teach this or, okay. Um, but it, the metaphor here is what keeps a river, what keeps a river fresh and alive? Well, the only thing that keeps a river clean and fresh uh, and alive is if parts of that river leave it for a while. And they leave it for a while, and they create this thing called wetlands. It's swampy. It's murky. It's dirty. It's messy. It's... And we've always, in the past, our ancestors, when you got wetlands, plug it in. Plug it up. Fill it in. And now we realize, no, I mean, why are environmentalists saying some of the most precious things in nature? You know, because this is nature's cleansing system. This is how nature cleanses the river. It takes some of the water that's filled with toxins and all sorts of pollutants, and it goes through this, this filtering process called wetlands. And in this wetlands period, which is murky and messy and, and, and just not very fun, it removes the toxins and the pollutants, and then the water comes back into it, if it keeps tracking with the river. It, it comes back in and refreshes and rejuvenates that river with fresh, clean water. And what happened to me is at 17, I deconverted. I left the river. I left the Christian stream. I said, I'm out of here. And I became a raging atheist. I became, I had my Marxist phase, I had my Maoist phase. I mean, you wouldn't believe me from 17 to 23. Um, I even went to a seminary only because I was getting, I got my PhD in MDiv in four years. I just did both things at the same time. Why not? It took 30, 30 hours a semester for a couple, for three years. But neither school, I knew I was doing it. I shouldn't say that today, but uh, but um, the only way I justified it, because I was still in my Marxist phase, was as I was doing this, is um, I went to the God is Dead seminary, and I could do that. The seminary where they had a whole God is Dead theology department. It was a little after the God is Dead movement, but some of the faculty were still there. Yeah, I can go to a seminary where nobody believes God exists. So... But here's the thing, as I'm going through, because I had a lot of, there are a lot of toxins in heavy legalism that you find in these Amish traditions. And the tradition I was brought up in was Pentecostal holiness. All do's, no, I mean, all don'ts, no do's, all no's, no yeses, all about propositions and doctrines, not relationships. But I left it, and then I went into the swamps. But my swamp period, and that's a whole other story, how it kept tracking with the church. You see, I was a, I needed, I, we were very poor, I needed to make money. And um, I was, an, I played the piano, so I learned how to play the organ. So I was an organist. Guess how I put myself through school? So guess where I was every Sunday? And I couldn't escape the church. 
even when I was in my raging Rumspringa rebellion, my swamp, my liminality is what Victor Turner calls it. I was in a liminality. And then something happened to brought me back in. And now I thank God for this heritage that I have, but I had to get rid of the toxins. I had to get rid of the pollutants. So now I can thank God for it. My, my, I have one brother who never left it. He's a PhD in, at Princeton, and, and um, he's still struggling with a lot of stuff. I'm just like, John, just get over that. You know, that's no big deal. And he's still. And I have another brother who uh, also has a PhD. He's a teacher at one of the University of Virginia schools. But he, he, he didn't track it. He just left it and kept going. So he did his swamp, but his swamp went off in a different direction. I kept tracking. Um, so God used that. I mean, here, here's the paradox, though, and here's the irony. The moment I said at 17, God, I don't believe you exist, and if you do exist, I think I can do God better than you. You're a really bad God. I said that. Here's the paradox. The moment I said that, I am now, for the first time in my life, what? On the path to God. <laughs> because for the first time in my life, I'm what? In a relationship with God, even though it's a negative one. Even though it's an I hate you, God, if you exist. But I am now for the first time in a relation. I'm talking to God as Len Sweet, not through my parents, not through the, not through the tradition. I am now. And what does God want more from us than anything? A relationship. So the paradox is when I was most defiant and deconverted and I said, I'm out of here. I want nothing to do with this whole Christian tradition thing. I'm done. Um, and I can date my deconversion. I can tell you what song, the verse, the words, when it happened. Um, but that moment, paradoxically, my real journey towards faith began. Because now I'm in a relationship with God for the first time as Len Sweet. So that's how I'm able to do this. Yeah, over here. Who do you think is the best male preacher in the U.S.? Ken Ulmer. I dedicated my preaching text to him. Um, he, he is, um, African-American, um, his church, he's Foursquare. His church is the one that bought, uh, the stadium where the Lakers played before they moved to their new place. I think, I just say, he and I do a lot of road trips together, but you, I never preach after Ken Elmer. You never preach after Ken Elmer. You just, and he is, I think, the best, best preacher. Uh, and I'd say in the world, I think he is the best preacher in the world. He's just that incredible. So if you've not heard a Ken Elmer sermon um, or, or heard Ken Elmer, it's, it's actually worth a trip to L.A. just to hear him. Yeah. So being able to speak and to be able to listen and narrow form makes sense, but how do you add a soundtrack? And can you talk more about the idea of how to speak with the soundtrack? Yeah. And, and I come from a movement that um, has lost its soundtrack, but we initially, the, method, the whole Methodist movement uh, began with a soundtrack. I mean, that's what John Wesley preached, and Charles Wesley took what John Wesley preached and put music to it. And, um, and it created a, a revolution. Here's the, here's the challenge that we're under. And I intimated that yesterday when I asked you to imagine pictures of Jesus doing all sorts of things. And you had no image. I guarantee you, none of you had an image of Jesus singing. We, don't, we can imagine Jesus doing anything. Preaching, teaching, healing, eating. But nobody in history has even painted a picture of Jesus. But we know he sang. First of all, there's another one of those cases that, you know, there's no words that say, well, there is a word that says Jesus sang. Where is it? Yeah. And we even know what he sang. Before, the, before he went to the garden, the last thing he did after he ate with his disciples, 
And probably, we don't know exactly how it happened. He could have, but when you were singing, the, the Seder, the Passover meal always ended with one of the Hillel Psalms, and it starts with 113. So probably, it's 113 to 118 are the Hillel Psalms. So probably he at least sang all of 118, I mean 113. Whether they may have sung 113, 114, 150, it's an ensemble of psalms that were associated with that meal. But we even know the song that he and his disciples sang. Whether Now, we know they would have gotten up from the table. They would not have just reclined and sung the song. Whether they made a circle around the triclinium table, whether they went into the middle of the table and, and, and held hands together, we don't know. But, you, but somebody needs to paint this. Somebody out there, please paint. <laughs> Start painting uh, an image of Jesus and his disciples just before he goes out to the garden singing. We don't have any image of it. So there is a Jesus soundtrack. I mean, part of it is Jesus, the, the Jewish faith has a soundtrack. It's the Psalms. And the Psalms was their soundtrack. And they were always chanting the Psalms. You never said the Psalms. You always sang the Psalms. And this is another case of where we totally missed it, just focusing on the, on the words. Um, anybody part of traditions that did the seven last words on Good Friday? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. Some, some, okay, so you do. That's great. You asked the question. So seven last words, they have, we actually, there are services from like 12 to 2, uh, and sometimes in the evening, 7 to 9, where they assign different clergy, you get a different word. These are the seven last words. It is absolutely the grossest versitis that you can do to turn what happened on the cross into seven Last words. Because we've totally missed the three, three of the greatest stories of the New Testament, of all the Gospels, and we've missed them as stories. And one, one is the story of Jesus between these two thieves. And the last thing he does is witness to them about who he is and engage them in a relationship, in a conversation. I mean, he's dying for the sins of the world, and yet he's, he's reaching out to these two thieves on either side of him, probably part of Barabbas' crew. Barabbas is supposed to be in the middle, and he was the head of a gang of bandits and thieves, so probably these are two of Barabbas' chief lieutenants. See what I just did? I connected dots. That's not what we're doing. We aren't connecting dots. But Barabbas is... Pilate thought Barabbas would be the one in the middle. The, the religious established said, no, we want Jesus. Majority ruled. By the way, every time majority rules in the Bible, are ruled wrong. But that's a whole other story. All right. Yeah, majority rule killed Jesus. Okay. So you've got this incredible story of Jesus and these two thieves you got then this another credible story, one of the most touching, memorable stories in the whole Bible, as Jesus, who's dying for the sins of the world, being most cosmic, most universal, but he's got a problem on his hands. He's got a fractured relationship between his birth family and his new family. And he, how can he die and reconcile and redeem the world when his own family has a brokenness to it. Do you ever wonder why Jesus chose nobody from his first 30 years as part of his disciples? For a reason. In fact, when he does go back to his hometown, they want to kill him. In fact, that can any good come out of Nazareth means that those Nazarenes, those, that family of Mary, were known as nasty people. Why do you think Joseph, she's nine months pregnant, and she's safer with him to travel 70 miles to Bethlehem than to be left with her own family? Come on. So we have this incredible moment where Jesus, dying for the sins of the world, reaches out and says, John, behold your mother, Mary. Behold your son. And then it says, and Mary moved out. 
out of the household with James, who's not a disciple yet, has nothing to do with Jesus, doesn't like him, and moves in with John to symbolize that. Okay, so we got two of these. What about? So you got five more words? No. No. You got one more story. And all the words are part of this one story. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? What is that? Those are Jesus' words? <sighs> no. Jesus, those aren't his words. That's the first line of a song. Jesus never would have said that psalm. He would have. This is the greatest song I ever sung in the history of the world, and we missed it. We missed it. Jesus ushered himself into eternity doing what? With a soundtrack. Singing. Psalm 22. You read Psalm 22. Read it. And the rest of the five, the rest of those words are there in Psalm 22. I thirst. In fact, it ends with, Psalm 22 ends with, it is done. Uh, another translation of it is. So you know Jesus sang the whole song. We, we got, we haven't even begun to understand the Jesus soundtrack. And understand Jesus. Um, did he sing it once? Did he sing it a couple of times? We don't know. But we know he sang. Psalm 22. And it's not a song of despair. It is a song of triumph. It is a song of victory. Reread it. Um, yeah, who else? So soundtrack is so important, especially for this culture. Um, and that's why I think we've got we've to use, we're to be in the world, not of it. So if we're to be in the world, why are we not using some of these songs from the world? I mean, look at Avicii's Wake Me Up. You can use that in church. You can use it in church. In fact, a, a good translation of verily, verily, I say unto thee, or in the other one say, I tell you the truth, but a, another translation of it is wake up. Listen up. Pay attention. That's what you have ears to hear means. Pay, pay attention. Listen up. Um, wake up in a culture of zombiedom where everybody's walking dead, drugged by all sorts of addictions. The only one that can wake up your being, every fiber of your being, is Jesus. Wake up. And a culture is crying out, wake me up. See, see what I'm doing? I'm just use the, use the soundtrack that's already out there and, and um, use it for the glory of God. Um, yeah, who else? You mentioned how um, at the beginning, uh, to some degree, the answer of evangelizing has been just to ask your friends to go to church and how that's no longer working. Um, and in the past, I don't know, maybe like 30 years, to some degree, the answer has been like make uh, a church that you feel more comfortable inviting your friends to, the seeker-sensitive church movement. And where do you see that headed now that that's really stopped working as much as it has in the past? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think we've, our whole strategy of a, any form of come to church evangelism is wrong. Because evangelism is basically not come to church anyways, it's come to Christ. And that ought to be our focus. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I guess it's time to go. But if I be lifted up, what? I will draw. <laughs> okay. If I be lifted up, I will draw. See, we don't trust Jesus to do what he says he's going to do. So we go to drawing boards and we draw up this strategy and draw up this design and draw up this program and draw up this this new, you know, no. Your job and mine is to simply what? Lift him up and get out of the way. And that's basically what we've got to learn to do. 
is to trust that he is the draw. It's not my preaching that's the draw. It's not my the church's music that's the draw. It's not our people that's the draw. He's the draw. We've got to lift up Christ. And now the question is then, how do you lift up Christ? You lift him up in the language of the culture through narrative soundtrack, narrative soundtrack. You lift him up that way. Um, which is not, and the, so you've seen the replacement out there just learn to tell your story. No. This is not a culture interested in your story and my story, especially if I find out we're Jesus followers. We've got to learn to, if I sit next to somebody in a plane, I've got six million miles under me, so I do this a lot. And if I'm sitting next to somebody in a plane and I go, um, can I tell you how much Jesus means to me? Can I, can I tell you my story? You know what they're doing? They're hitting the button. Yeah, can I find another seat? Please, I'll take anything to sit next to this guy. But if I start off with, um, tell me your story. Where where you headed? Okay. So I'm now trying, I'm not doing show and tell, either showing and telling my story or showing and telling his story, but I'm, shutting up and listening, trying to draw out their story. Now, as I'm drawing out their story, I'm trying to relate their story to what? People love to tell their story. Have you noticed that? And people, I mean, I don't get it. Um, People love to tell their story. Um, Not just Donald Trump. People love to tell their story. And... As I'm listening to their story and drawing out their story, I'm also trying to connect their story to what? My story? To his story. And I'm going to find ways. I don't even have to mention what it is. You know, well, your story reminds me of another story. A story is this this guy. You know what a eunuch is? Oh, there was this Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, Really? How many times have they ever heard of a story of an Ethiopian eunuch? But they, and so then I tell the story of the Ethiopian eunuch, and you let the story speak for itself. You ought to say, this is the scripture, and the verses are these. We just tell the story. And you connect their story to his story in some way that you can. And then you find out that, oh, I'd like to, that, that's really, that really helps me to understand some things about my own story. And then you just let Jesus work. <laughs> that's, that's. That's the new form of evangelism in a missionary culture. Listen, thank you all. Appreciate you all being here. Thank you.